All right. All right, so today we're gonna to be just going over a, a simple method to monitor hemolysis or blood damage in real time. Um, as I said, we wanted to use this as a tool in our research to look at how, say, turbulence interacts with blood cells, um, but it also has clinical applications, as we'll see. Uh, this was a project that I started at Princeton University as a postdoc and then kind of brought it with me to the University of Delaware. And this is with Galad R. Lotz and Alexander Smits from Princeton. Uh, so I'd like to start out by just kind of talking about a case study instead of just a general introduction. So consider a, a patient that gets regular dialysis for some, maybe some uh, renal disease or anything that would require dialysis. Um, this is a 66-year-old female patient. And all of a sudden during dialysis or short, shortly after dialysis, they started to experience nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and shortness of breath. And these are all um, uh, symptoms of when your blood is too damaged, when you're putting damaged blood back into your body. And they had found that she had actually had damaged blood levels of up to 10%. And luckily she fully recovered and this is, it's great, but it's, uh, it's kind of, it points to a possible area where human error can really cause problems in terms of a, a re fairly regular medical procedure like dialysis. So something like a possible pinched tubing and setting up the machine or maybe the machine was, it came faulty, but there are cases where what's supposed to be making your blood more healthy, uh, you're actually damaging the blood before you're putting it back in. And not just kind of life-threatening or people getting sick, but also blood damage is a major cost uh, to, to a lot of, in places where they take a lot of blood, blood samples. 60% uh, of damaged blood samples are due to hemolysis. Um, and this can be caused from uh, blood being drawn too quickly, the needle being too close to arterial walls, uh, shaking of the sample after it's taken. Um, and these damaged samples lead to just generally wasted time and money for both the patient and the, the clinician. Um, and I am not a doctor by any means, so I, I apologize if I say things wrong. You're getting kind of a mechanical engineer's perspective on, on this area. Um, but I think that it, it goes to show that it would be valuable to have a way to measure blood damage simply and accurately in cases where you're actually dealing with the blood, whether it's being taken or whether it's in a dialysis situation. <clears throat> so the way that we typically measure damaged blood is it's actually kind of a, an interesting but lengthy process. I'll quickly go over it. So you would have to gather some blood sample um, and what you want to do is you want to extract the plasma from your blood. So the plasma is what the blood cells float around in, in the, the whole blood of your body. Um, so you want to spin it around really fast to try to separate out that plasma. And then what you do is you create something called a Drabkin solution, um, where essentially you're looking at how much of the, the insides of a blood cell has gotten into the, the plasma, that's the hemoglobin. And then you use this fancy thing that looks kind of like an office printer. Uh, that measures the color of this plasma drabkin solution very accurately. And based on the color, you can tell whether or not you think that maybe blood has been damaged. And this is all a fairly lengthy process that usually requires a technician and kind of sending the blood out to a specific laboratory. So we wanted to ask the question, can we directly and actively measure blood damage? Um, we, what we wanted to do was kind of thinking about it mechanically was take advantage of blood conductivity. The blood cells, like I said, they red blood cells float around in a plasma as they go through your body. And plasma is generally electrically conductive. So it passes electrons through it, an electron charge. And you can imagine the more blood cells you have, the harder it is for electrons to flow uh, through the plasma because blood cells themselves are insulating to electricity. But a nice benefit of blood cells is as they break open, they release their hemoglobin, which is rich with iron, and it becomes the insides of a blood cell are conductive, even though they, they're insulated by the cell wall. So you can imagine that as more blood cells either go away or break, the, the general conductivity of your blood will go up. It will become less resistant to electrical, uh, elect, electrical charge. So our hypothesis was that, well, if you have a case where the blood is being damaged, that should, the conductivity of the blood should correlate directly to that blood damage. Uh, so that's uh, essentially what we wanted to test. So we designed a benchtop experimental setup that uh, would probably have a lot of clinicians wincing. Um, 
So this was a simple blood pump driven uh, by a peristaltic pump, and that's um, I think that the pump representative of what is common in dialysis machines, at least the style. Um, we had a reservoir that held our fluid, so our working fluid uh, was uh, porcine blood or pig's blood. And then the, the blood would pass through this micro channel that we 3D printed with conductive walls. And as it, as it passes through, we monitor the resistance across the two yellow plates, um, and that gives us the conductivity measurement as blood flows through. And then if we change something like the conductivity of the sample, we should see the, that conductivity change in our measurement device, which is a, a, a very fancy version of uh, just a resistance meter. And we wanted to verify that it works, so uh, we we started with salt water uh, that has a very known conductivity versus salt concentration. Uh, this was just to make sure that we could, in fact, measure the conductivity of a fluid as it passes through our channel. And it worked really well. So we'll see, we see here, this is uh, resistivity, which is the inverse of conductivity uh, versus time. And then at certain time intervals, we would add concentrations of, of salt. And we saw that the resistivity would jump when we added salt to the system. It would stabilize, then we would add salt, more salt. Um, and then as we got higher and higher concentration, the, the saline solution became more and more conductive. So we were just happy that this seemed to work fairly well. It matched both a conductivity meter, which is another way to measure a conductivity of a liquid, um, and also the theory, the theoretical uh, approximation for what the conductivity should be. But next we moved on to, to blood. So pig's blood is, was our working fluid. And what we did is we started in our reservoir, we used healthy blood. Um, and then what we would do is we would slowly at certain time intervals add damaged, mechanically damaged blood. So this was basically, a, a, we had a separate blood sample that was as damaged as we could get it. And then we would add uh, samples of that to the, the overall uh, working fluid. And then we would see how the blood resistance changed with time as we added this damaged blood. And on the left here, we have blood resistance versus time. Um, and then the, the solid line, that's the reading from the LCR meter. So that's the active reading of the blood resistance. And you can see the step-like nature of it is because at certain times what we did is we added damaged blood and then we waited and then we would add damaged blood again. But what we do see nicely is that the blood resistance does decrease with time, meaning as we added damaged blood, it became more conductive. Um, and then on top of that, what we did is we plotted spectrophotometer readings, and that corresponds to the right-hand vertical axis. And that's a direct measure of hemolysis percentage, so the percent of your blood that's damaged. And we see this inverse correlation where as we added more damaged blood, as we expected, the overall solution's hemolysis percentage went up as a step-like structure. And if we combine these two behaviors, on the right, we can look at blood conductivity, which is just the inverse of the resistance versus hemolysis. And we see this is the, essentially the correlation that we were looking for and we expected to see um, that blood conductivity is in fact directly correlated to the hemolysis percentage and it looks to be a primarily linear correlation. And actually, we, we did an even finer experiment. We found we could see blood hemolysis percentages that reliably down to one or two percent. So we could uh, fairly accurately see hemolysis happening in real time with just a conductivity meter. So what now, uh, I guess? Uh, we have this new tool for monitoring blood damage actively that we're pretty excited about. Um, I think there are kind of two routes things could go. Uh, I'm not a, a clinical research type person, but there, I think there are opportunities for clinical application, um, especially in cases where you have the same patient and maybe blood is actively being damaged and there are no other variables like other patients involved, um, you, could, you could incorporate this in a dialysis machine pretty easily where you just look at the resistance of the blood going in and coming out. And if you see a major difference in the resistance of your blood, you have a reason to believe something bad happened in between those two points that you measured the resistance. Um, for myself, what I'm more interested in is the laboratory research aspect because I'm interested in how blood cells and, and other things or interact with uh, turbulent flow or kind of high shear environment. So I, I want to use this as a tool to measure blood damage in real time, measuring the in them in their natural or industrial environments. So that includes red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. 
I, hopefully I didn't take too long, we'll see. But thanks for having me, I really appreciate it and I'll take any questions you might have.